fire on the mountain, a call for true and transforming worship. I'm honored to have been invited to come and speak to you on this great, great subject. My prayer for you and for the church of Jesus Christ in our land is that we would realize again what an awesome, awesomely glorious and gracious God we serve. I am convinced, however, that this will not happen until we, His people, collectively and corporately experience a new outburst of divine fire in our worship of Him. Oh, I'm not saying that we can expect God to do for us every Sunday morning what He did on that singular occasion on Mount Sinai more than 3,000 years ago, but perhaps He will visit us in some way that will drive us to our knees, convict us of our sin, especially in the way we've been trivializing worship, and impress on our hearts and our minds afresh the glorious but undeserved privilege that is ours to serve Him. When our kids were small, they used to say, do we have to go to church? And we used to say, yes, we have to. That's pathetic. No, we don't have to. We get to by His grace. In Exodus 19 to 24, we observe the first corporate worship scene in the Bible. Here the focus is clearly on the revelation of God, and well it should be, for the Israelites' view of God prior to Sinai was rather pathetic. Moses himself says, I'm going to, they're going to say, who sent you, and what shall I say? And well, who's he? No idea. But there's a lesson here. In authentic worship, what the worshiper experiences and learns of God, and what the worshiper hears from God, as I said yesterday, are always more important than what the worshiper does for God. Indeed, only by His grace does He invite us to this audience with himself and the privilege of being in his presence. Our agenda for this morning is to look at another element in worship. Yesterday we talked about the object of our worship. Who is this one we worship? The Lord, the great King, above all gods. And we defined worship as uh, reverential acts of submission and homage before this divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accord with his will. From Psalm 95, we learn something about who this king is. Now we need to ask who it is that's invited to his presence, the subject of worship. And by that I mean who is the rightful subject of the verb to worship? Who may worship acceptably to God? Who may offer these reverential acts of submission in His presence, and what does it mean to do it in accord with His will? In other words, who may climb this holy mountain? Who may enter the presence of the divine king? Who will be received before his throne and invited to stand in his presence? Now, before we answer that question, let's just think about how that question is being answered in our time. Unfortunately, in some places it still is, whoever, whoever has my kind of skin. In some churches it is whoever has the right social status or whoever will dress the right way, and that could be up or down. To these we say, you dress right, you got money, you got the right skin, come, you are welcome here. But if you don't fit, sorry. In some circles, especially churches that are deemed very progressive, the answer is simply whoever. Y'all come, 
as if acceptable worship is possible by all and sundry, to use an old English word. And so we gear our services to attract the greatest number of people, particularly the non-Christian or the marginal, that is, the carnal Christian. That's language we used to use. You don't hear it anymore. The Sunday morning get-together becomes a come-as-you-are event, a meeting to which all have access, and it is reflected in a song you know. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come just as you are to worship. Come just as you are before your God. Come. One day every knee, tongue will confess that you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you. Know, so come, just as you are. Come. Well, it's also reflected in these words, which I took from the website of um, Wharfdale Vineyard Church in Leeds, England. This is what they had on their website. I checked this morning. They've modified. I'll show the, the new one a little bit, but here. We welcome you to the community, full stop. You don't need to be anything. You don't need to be married with kids or teetotal or employed or in good health. You certainly don't need to be holy. You can come from any background, religious, social, cultural, or racial. Jesus accepts everyone as they are, and we aim to do the same. Here's what they have now. It's modified. I don't know if they got a hold of the book. <laughs> Come as you are, you are welcome. Full stop, you don't have to dress. But there is no reference. You don't have to be holy. And a couple of other is. But we need to ask ourselves, is this the biblical view? Now, we know that the call to salvation is absolutely unconditional. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, without any human effort. This was also true for the Israelites. When the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt, we witnessed the paradigmatic salvation exodus events. He didn't come to them in Egypt and say, all right, here are the Ten Commandments. As soon as you can check off every one of these, I'll get you out of here. No, that wasn't the case. All the Lord asked of his people was, follow Moses through the Red Sea. If you can trust him to hold up the walls of water while you cross over to the other side, you're free. What did it take to get out of Egypt? Nothing but faith. And they got out. Now, if we look at Exodus 19, where I will settle down for a little while, which in my estimation represents the supreme worship event recorded in the Old Testament, we note that worship begins with the initiative of God and occurs by His invitation. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Notice the subject of the verbs. Who saved Israel? God did. On what basis did God save Israel? By grace alone. There is nothing here like, I've seen how good you are. I see you keep the commandments. I see that you are obedient. I see how faithfully you bring your sacrifice as a reward for your devotion. I've rescued you from Egypt. No, a thousand times no. And the answer is no with respect to our salvation as well. God doesn't look on us and say, I see you're a good person. You're kind. You give generously to the church. You teach Sunday school. As a reward for your efforts, I'll save you from your sin. No, salvation doesn't work that way. Salvation has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the call to salvation. But as we will see, the call to worship is quite different. Let's look a little bit at Exodus chapter 19. If you have your, old, your Bibles open, I'm not going to read the whole text, but I'll, I'll pick up a few observations from this pack, uh, chapter. In Exodus 19, we observe the ceremonial, external, formal prerequisites for this worship event. 
And it's interesting, the Lord did not say, y'all come as you are. We note that the call to salvation, call to worship are quite different in this chapter. Here we hear, here, here we hear the Lord set two or three conditions for acceptable worship in that context. First, the Israelites are to recognize His holiness, that there is a vast difference between the one who calls you to an audience with himself and the audience. And so they are to build a fence around the mountain for the protection of the people, for a direct hit of divine holiness is lethal. Recognize the sanctity of God. Build a fence around the mountain. Worship may not be taken casually. Second, consecrate yourselves. Before the worship event, they were supposed to do this. That's the word. In this context, it probably means make yourselves ceremonially pure, fit for worship by performing certain ritual procedures. It doesn't tell us what they were. But the text does, uh, does say, except in verse 14, it adds that they washed their garments. Presumably, the rituals also involved, notice this notice comes three days in advance. Get ready for three days. It probably involved three days of confession, ceremonial washing of their bodies, so that when they entered the presence of the Lord, they were spotless inside and out. There's a recognition here. You do not appear before the king in your grubbies. Third, the men are to stay away from their wives. But what's that got to do with anything? The statement seems odd. But I think we need to understand this as shorthand form of fasting. Don't go near a woman. It is not a way of telling all married persons from now on no more sexual activity as the community of shakers imposed upon their people. Don't go near a woman. It's not, it's not a way of telling abstain from all sexual activity. It's probably shorthand for abstinence for all kinds of activities. Things that are otherwise perfectly normal and good, but the king is coming. All attention is to be focused on the king and the glorious privilege of this appointment with the king, the heavenly king. Prepare yourself mentally and spiritually. The Lord is coming. Now, this recipe for worship seems simple. I can remember the kinds of preparation we went through when I was younger in another millennium, growing up on the farm in northern Saskatchewan. By about 3 o'clock, it's, it's a lovely Norman Rockwell picture. By about 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, the pace of life would slow down. We'd milk the cows a half hour earlier, and then we would have what my mother called fire abend, celebration evening. After supper, we would all polish our shoes, do our Sunday school lessons, and then read or have a quiet game of Chinese checkers. Sometimes, and when, actually, yes, more than sometimes, often, we would listen to Hockey Night in Canada on the radio, and we'd be around the, the radio listening. Didn't have television. Of course, this is another millennium and another world. Mother would put the last minute touches on the potato salad for Sunday noon meal. The Sunday noon meal was almost always a cold meal prepared in advance that we might keep the Sabbath. And we'd go to, the bed, go to bed relaxed and get up the next morning refreshed and ready for worship. That all seems so worlds away. Another planet, really. When we compare the hectic pace of life today, and those of you with kids know what that's like. But is this all there is to worshiping God? Just getting ready externally? Does this guarantee us acceptance with God? 
Unfortunately, this is how many have acted and thought down through history. We think that all we need to do is show up in church and God ought to be impressed. And so we pride ourselves in being there on time Sunday mornings. And those of us who are really spiritual are involved in college and career activities, campus charities, Bible studies, whatever else is going on, we're there. And we think God is obligated to hear us. But hold on a minute. Is this all? We finally get to our text for the morning Psalm 24. Actually, our text in in Exodus had already hinted at this. If you look at verses 5 and 6, of the Israelites gathered before him at Mount Sinai, the Lord requires a declaration of total allegiance to himself. After saying, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself, he says, now then, if you will listen to my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Oh, Moses reports these words back to the people, and notice their response in verse 8, and all the people answered all together, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Now, there's something quite remarkable remarkable about this. These people have no idea what God will demand of them. He had just said in very generic terms, now then, if you listen to my voice and keep my covenant, whatever that is. Now, we tend to interpret listen to my voice as obey my voice, as if all that comes out of God's mouth is commands. But there's a lot more to what comes out of God's mouth than orders. In fact, in the very next chapter, when God starts to speak, what's the first thing we hear out of his mouth? It's gospel. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The gospel always precedes command. Don't forget the gospel which is why the most important worship element for Christians is the Lord's Supper, where we hear and are reminded of the gospel. God speaks more than command. He also reminds us of our story and His grace. But notice the people's response. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We have a tendency to think that the Israelites were called to a particular code of conduct. No, they weren't. They were called to relationship with God. I brought you to myself. You didn't say, here are the Ten Commandments. No. And in response to that relationship, as grateful, redeemed people, they say, totally, we're on. All that you say. The interesting thing is these people are still at Sinai. The Lord had, he had invited them to worship uh, But this, the problem now becomes Sinai is a one-off event. Sinai is never repeated. Things happen quite, the tone changes significantly when they start to worship regularly. In fact, when you go to the book of Deuteronomy and you explore how worship at the central sanctuary is to happen, it's a totally different turn. This is a scary moment in the end. Remember how the the, the story ends in chapter 19 after the Lord has spoken, the people say, stop, stop, Moses, we can't handle this, it'll kill us. And they're frightened. This is a one-off deal. They'd never had an encounter with God like this before. But when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, and there he starts describing regular worship at the central sanctuary, tone is totally different. Come, bring your offerings. Eat in my presence. Celebrate in my presence. The word Yahweh is still involved but it carries that other sense of awed trust, trusting awe, not fright anymore. But of course, we need to remember 
that this does not mean that the invitation is still unconditional to all. Come as you are. Actually, there are some expectations that determine whether or not worship is received positively by God. Now let's go to Psalm 24. I have uh, called this the moral prerequisites to acceptable worship. To some of us, that will look like too much like do-gooder kind of stuff. We might have labeled it spiritual prerequisites. But the two are so closely tied together that in this context, and when you look at the, the way he is working, that that's where the focus and the center of gravity is. Psalm 24 is a magnificent psalm. It divides into three parts, beginning with the object of worship. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And it, uh, then you've got a description of the subject of worship, which we'll come to in a moment. And then at the end, he comes back to the object of worship. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the glorious King may come in. Who is this King of glory? Yahweh strong and mighty, Yahweh mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, uh, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this glorious King, the Lord of hosts? He is the King of glory. I'm so glad we sang Psalm 23 before because Psalm 23 comes right before this, and you know how Psalm 23 ends. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Of course, that's the person for whom Yahweh is my shepherd, who has walked in paths of righteousness, who throughout his life has experienced the presence and the goodness of God. And now we have a picture of who is this one who invites us into his house. The psalm begins and ends by extolling the Lord in most enthusiastic terms, painting a picture of a conquering king returning from battle, heading up to the city gates, and he calls on the gates of the city as if they're living things. Open up! The glorious king is coming. Welcome the divine warrior, the one who has won Israel's victories. He is the Lord of hosts at the head of heaven's armies. This is the king of glory. But in the middle, he asks a very serious question. Who is invited? Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his presence? Of course, you recognize this is court language, isn't it? Imagine yourself in the ancient world, having been invited with, uh, to an audience with King Nebuchadnezzar or King Solomon or King David or, or any of the kings. Now, you could be invited to this throne room for several reasons. The king could call you to demand that you account to him for some misdeed and hereby call for your judgment and your punishment. And when, or he could call you to receive your petition or to bestow some honor you, uh, on you. So when the court official ushers you into his presence, signals you to come to enter the throne room, you would walk carefully up to the foot of the throne, and then you would fall down on your knees before the king in humility and a gesture of submission and homage, and you don't dare look up the chutzpah, let alone stand until you get the signal. Our psalm envisions, en envisions this kind of scene, except that in this case, the king before whom the worshiper appears is the Lord of glory. But the question is twofold. Who may ascend the mountain and appear before the Lord? And once we appear before the king, whom will he invite to stand? Now you need to recognize that that is a gesture of acceptance. 
When Ezekiel has that encounter with the Lord in chapter 1, he's down on his knees, as he should be. And then he hears a voice from heaven say, Stand, that I may speak with you. Stand. The the Lord taps him on the shoulder and gives this invitation. And of course, this reminds me of several other questions, places in Scripture where we've got this kind of expression. Who may ascend, whose worship is acceptable? Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Well, if we were asking this of the Israelites, all of us would have an answer. What did God demand of the Israelites? Well, He demanded keep the commands. That's our quick answer. We on this side of the cross trust, believe. To them, keep the commands. Really? How does Moses answer this one? Moses actually answers that question. Um, this is the heart and, and soul of the book of Deuteronomy right here. He gives three answers to the question, what does the Lord ask of Israel? He starts with a literal call for covenant loyalty, then a metaphorical call for covenant loyalty, circumcise therefore the foreskins of your hearts, and then he ends with another literal call for covenant loyalty. But I would like to look only at the first. What does God ask of the Israelites here? What does he ask? Now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? But serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commands and statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you. It's remarkable, really, isn't it? Five expressions. Why five? And I ask you, why are there ten commands in the Decalogue? I have a feeling it's a mnemonic thing to help you remember, one for every finger, so that as you're memorizing it, you know when you're done or when you're reciting. I think this has to do with a hand as well. Five for the hand, and it works this way. The first principle of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's your thumb. You don't have a thumb. You... You're an animal. That's what distinguishes us from the animals. We need the thumb, first principle of wisdom. Second, walking in all his ways. That's the pointing finger. How should we walk? And that is gloriously ambiguous, or is it ambivalent? What does it mean to walk in the ways of the Lord? Two things, I think, at least. Chris Wright is quite right here. It means to walk the way God tells you to walk, but it also means to walk the way God walks as he will say a couple of verses down, because the Lord loves the alien by giving him food and clothing, so you should love the alien. So that's there. And then number three, of course, right at the very center, the dominant finger, the, this is love. Covenant commitment demonstrated in action, always in the interest of the other person. That's love. And then you have serving the Lord your God. That's the ring finger. But, which, with which uh, the ring on the finger tells me of, reminds me of my devotion to my wife. I am yours. I serve you. And then finally, the pinky. Most of us would make that number one or at the heart of it, but it isn't. It's, it's the end of it. What does the Lord your God, long before there is this legalistic kind of obedience, you've got the disposition, its heart. But it also reminds me of the question that Micah asks, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself to God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord delight in thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? There are some who would argue that the difference between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship is in the Old Testament was external, in the New Testament it's internal. In the Old Testament it was liturgical and cultic, in the New Testament it's it's spiritual. Read on. Listen to Micah's answer. And of course the ultimate sacrifice is giving my own children. Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? But he has told you, O man, what is good and what Yahweh requires of you but to do mishpat, to love chesed, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what he asks. 
And the psalmist's response here is similar. Look at what he says. Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, that one shall receive a pronouncement of blessing from the Lord and a pronouncement of righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, ever since Cain and Abel, we've been debating what worship looks like, haven't we? Here's Cain's theology of worship. Cain thinks that if I bring my sacrifice, that gives God the lens with which to look on me and then accept me. Abel's is quite different. Abel, you, you remember the text, how I think it's an intentional grammatical play here. The Lord looked on Abel and accepted his sacrifice. The Lord looked on Cain and rejected his. The person is the lens through which God looks at the service. But this is the kind of game we're playing all the time. So many of us are on the, on, on, on the left side of the screen. We're with Cain. God is obligated to hear me. I was in church. Guarantees his favor. No, it doesn't. It is the other six days that determine how God responds to what we do in church. But look at the answer in Psalm 24. Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who do not devote themselves to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. That's practical stuff. This is not theoretical stuff. Notice then the Lord's response. That one will receive a blessing and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Four things he talks about here. Clean hands. And of course, literally, I suppose this means did I wash my hands this morning before I came to church? We were in Israel a year ago, and if you go to the hotels, so you'll find in all of the bathrooms, there are these pitchers with two handles. Because you have to wash, be careful to wash yourself with flowing water. It can't be just sitting in the basin and then purify. You know, all these, fo the focus on the ritual stuff, uh, this can't mean that. But here, I don't think he's talking about that. He's talking about hands as a metaphor for actions. And if you want a commentary for this, just read Psalm 15 which begins with the same kind of question. Oh, Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may reside on your holy mountain? Notice the, how similar these two questions are. The answer, the person who walks with integrity and acts righteously and speaks truth, the person who doesn't gossip with his tongue and doesn't harm his neighbor, then doesn't ridicule his friend, the person who has nothing to do with scoundrels, and even when one takes an oath that turns out to be harmful to oneself, doesn't go back on one's word, the person who doesn't exploit people by charging usurious interest for his loans, the person who refuses to take a bribe against the innocent, anyone who acts this way will never be shaken. I love that last verse. This is the person whose worship God accepts. Clean hands. Second, a clean heart. Oh, that changes things. So it isn't all only about the hands. In fact, from that Deuteronomy text, you could have figured it out. It really is about the heart first. Fear the Lord your God, walk in his ways, love him, serve him. That's this kind of stuff. Serve him with your heart. It's easy for us to look on the outside and judge a people by their actions. But as the Lord reminds Samuel in 1 6, Samuel 16, 7, God sees not as man sees, for man perceives on the basis of what the eyes see, but the Lord sees on the basis of the heart. From the beginning, Israelite religion was a heart religion. And this is what Jesus is trying to recapture for his own generation. When in the Sermon on the Mount, you've, he says, you've heard what, it was, what has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. That's the problem. 
On the outside, you can look like a pure conformist. And people will say, he's got it all together. But on the inside, the Pharisees were this kind of people, great on externals. They viewed themselves to be watchdogs of the people's conduct. But Jesus reminds us that even conduct can be fabricated and can arise out of ulterior motives and is not always a true measure of the heart. You know how easy it is to fake it. (laughs) Jeremiah says the heart is more deceitful than anything else, desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to person each according to his ways and according to the results of his deeds. Oh, that's a brilliant combination, isn't it? You are what you do for the most part. But there are ways in which we can pretend, the great pretender. Of course, we all know we can't change our own hearts. This has to be the work of God. Moses had indeed called for a circumcised heart in Deuteronomy 10, 19, but in Deuteronomy 36, he declares, the Lord will circumcise your heart to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, in order that you may live. If we would enter into the presence of the Lord and hope to find acceptance with him, we come on his terms with clean hands and by definition of clean, and his definition of clean and a pure heart by his definition of pure. Ezekiel knows that this takes a heart transplant, and we can't do that surgery ourselves either. But so the New Testament has the same perspective. Hear the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and following. For the love of Christ, that is Christ's love in us, controls us, having concluded that that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all that they should, who, should, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Therefore if anyone is is in Christ. He is a new creature. The old things have passed away. All things are new. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them. And I will argue that God was in Christ doing a transforming work to the ancient Israelites as well. It is on the basis of Christ's work that anybody, Old Testament or New Testament, has ever found acceptance with God. But this is a fabulous declaration. We have nothing in ourselves that merits acceptance, but thanks be to God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Our hearts can be made pure, and we then perform works of righteousness, which means our worship is acceptable to God. Third, quickly, the last two points. This person uncompromising devotion to God, has not lifted up his soul. I don't think that's your spiritual inner being. I think that's your whole person to falsehood. And I think in this context, that means idols. Idols are nothing but concrete evidence of twisted imaginations. These may not be necessarily gods of wood and stone. According to Job 31, 24 to 28, silver and gold can be our idols if I have put my trust in silver and gold, he says. That's a religious term there. Wealth may be an idol. The stock market can be an idol. But my own body can be an idol too. I know some of you find that hard to imagine. My education can be an idol my status, my ministry, my church, all of this. If anything other than God is the object of my allegiance, my worship will not be accepted. You shall love the Lord your God with all your inner being, with all your whole being, nefesh, and with all your stuff, resources, everything devoted to God, nothing left over for any other God. This is the psalmist version of the Shema, which has become a badge of Judaism. And unfortunately, it's a verbal badge. Every morning when they get up, Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu, only they don't say Yahweh, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. It's not about reciting that. It's about living it. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart. And finally, integrity. This person 
this person hasn't sworn deceitfully. He's kept his word. Yes means yes. No means no. According to Psalm 24, 5, those who enter the presence of God this way guaranteed the blessing of the Lord and the declaration of his favor from the God of their salvation. Now that's worth singing about. And that's why he bursts. It's as if by now he is like a volcano inside him, to use Jeremiah's language. Lift up your hands, O gates, be lifted up. This great king has revealed to us what it takes. And that is grace. This is the problem with pagan religions. They know the gods are angry. They don't know which god. They don't introduce themselves. They know the gods are angry. They know the sin has made the gods angry. And they know they have to do something to fix that. But they don't know which god it is. They don't know what the sin is. And they don't know what the solution is. The Israelites have the answer to all three questions. I am the Lord your God. And he reveals himself in full detail. It's all grace. My friends, I don't know where this leaves you, but as I've been wrestling with these issues this week, and I should say, wrestling with the Lord, resisting his call to worship on his terms, telling him that what I think he should accept. But like Jacob, we need to become limp in the hands of God, play doll in his palms, so that he can make of us what he wants and we will respond to him as pleases him. True worship involves reverential acts of submission and homage before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation. He wouldn't have had to reveal himself, but he did. And in response to his gracious revelation of his will. May the Lord deliver us from the tyranny of externalism. May the, Lord deliver, may the Lord drive us to our knees so that when we appear in his presence to seek his face, we come humbly, brokenly, honestly, with open hands and a pure heart. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. As we leave this morning, may we hear the words of the king. Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's the gospel. May God help us worship him in spirit.